Um, good morning, everyone. It is 10-12, and we will call this meeting to order via Zoom. And I am not very tech savvy, so I did have to have my daughter help me get all this set up. Um, the first thing would be roll call, and I can read it. I know it gets difficult, numerous people talking at once. Um, it's all in print. Will Martin is here. Jason Paul, Tommy, Emil. Those are the BAC members, I believe, that I can see. Uh, Ms. Rogers, I am here. This is Kim Kiplin. I believe, uh, I believe that uh, Melody Green is also joining through 214. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. Not a problem whatsoever. Please. And sorry, this is Tyler Vance. Sorry to interrupt you too, but there's an attendee under the name of Jose Oriegas that uh, very well, maybe Veronica. Not sure. Veronica, is that you? Are you here? Good morning, Veronica. Are you with us? Okay. Well, we'll move on from there. And if she, if it is her, maybe she can join us. Um. Meeting minutes item. Number five, meeting minutes from March 4th, 2020. I was not in attendance at this meeting, but I did go over the meeting minutes that are posted. I did not have any problem with those. I um, did not see any issues with those. Within those minutes, before we approve those, within those minutes, um, since I was not at the last meeting, Trace had said that I would look back and do the, the January meeting minutes. Once again, I read those. I had no problem with those. So first, we'll be doing the meeting minutes from the prior meeting. Do I have a motion to accept those meeting minutes as they are posted? I'll make it. This is Emil. Okay. okay. Thank you, Emil. Good morning. This is Veronica. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am, Veronica, we can hear you now. Wait, sorry, thank you. Yes, I, I'm Listen, guessing. This is Will, I second that motion. Thank you, Will, greatly appreciate it. Those meeting minutes are approved and accepted as they're posted. Now we'll vote on the March 4th meeting minutes. Do I have a motion to accept those meetings as they appear online? This is Veronica. I'll make the motion. Go ahead. I'll take it as Emil makes the motion, Veronica seconds. Perfect. We will accept those meeting minutes as they appear online. I have to, excuse me, it takes me a minute because I'm doing the notes also for the meeting. Um, if we can, item number six is report on the Tech Slaughter Commission meeting. If we can skip that until we have a trace. Because he would be the one to give that. Let's move down to number seven. Discussion and possible action on rules up for review and change. Chair of that group, I believe, is Melody. Melody, is that correct? Yes. Okay. You would like to take the Kim, can I interrupt for just a second? Trace said he's on. He needs somebody to unmute him. Oh, good. Tom, you let me know. Or Tyler. Want me to pause or wait? Yeah, if you would pause for just a second, Bill. It's the 903 number if you can. I, I, can you hear me? Yes, Trace. Thank you very much. I appreciate you getting in. Good grief, man. I want to tell you what. I don't know. I, I hope y'all all know I'm a technological idiot. I really am. But that was really complicated to get in. I was clicking the link and I apologize for my tardiness. Uh, Kim, are you sweating yet? Well, yes. I, I'm as tech savvy as you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I do apologize to everybody. Uh, Kim, you're doing a fine job. You just want to take it from here, or you want me to step in? Oh, you absolutely take the floor, sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Um, uh, Melody, if you don't mind, before we uh, jump into your deal, if you want, I, I, I was listening to y'all, um, the report on the commissioner's meeting. Um, if y'all want me to go ahead, I'll go ahead and give that. Um, at the commissioner's meeting, um, the last one, um, we talked. I talked about uh, the bingos opening and the slow status and thousands of money to get back uh, up to speed and reopen all the refits that the bingo halls had to do and to uh, keep that in mind. Um, and that um, we will be talking about the rules and the COVID stuff in our in our meeting today. Um, told them that we'd be uh, trying to get um, open up the application process to get a new member. Um, and one of the things that I spoke about was that it was the first time in history since Bingo's inception uh, in the state of Texas that charitable bingo had been closed statewide. And to keep in mind that that really, really, really is detrimental to the charities in the state of Texas because they weren't raising any money during that time. Um, the charity spent a lot of money on precautionary shields, dividers, refitting, sanitizing, getting ready for uh, stuff. And that they also um, spent a lot of money on keeping their insurance and their electricity and their rents up when they didn't have an income. And so that would probably result in a lot of uh, waiver requests that I'm sure Tom has really gotten a lot of and thanks to the the operating staff and Tom Hansen to you know for being really receptive of that and understanding uh, of the hardships the charities are going through during this time and I'm sure that they are as well I know Tom's been operating from on a skeleton staff and a lot of people have been working from home and we'd really appreciate their uh, their efforts and their um, their understanding in this difficult time so that Thank was you my for that, report. Trace. Um, yes, sir. Um, I uh, wonder if you want to talk about the renewal of the BAC and the uh, the annual plan. Ah, uh, yes, that's right. Correct. Uh, we did go through the. Uh, we did get renewed. Uh, obviously, I sent out an email on that that we did get renewed, and we are uh, able to uh, go for another year. Uh, the commission. Um, gave us an annual work plan uh and i do not have that in front of me right now i can't get to it because i'm on the meeting call uh, but we do have an annual work plan that i've sent out and there's a lot of room in there to add extra things um, so we can add to the actual work plan uh, but I'm, I'm sure everybody has it on their email but i would i would assume that we need to uh, vote to accept that. Is that correct, Tom? Or do we have to do that? Okay, so I'm not the one to ask about that. Uh, Tyler, you want to weigh in? Um, my thought is that's not really something that the BAC accepts or rejects. That, that, that That's kind of the direction the commission has given them. And so I think it would be you know, we can summarize what it is, but I don't think it's something that the committee needs to take a vote on. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, we will uh, we'll review that again and go back over that at another time. I know we've got a lot going on today. Um, it is what it is, so we will we will follow that. I appreciate that. If I may just jump in real quick. Emil, can I get you to mute sure. your mic and uh, check in for some echo we're getting? There we go. Thanks. All right. Yeah. At any rate, that was my uh, report to the uh, TLC Commission. Uh, and um, I guess we'll go on to number seven and let uh, Melody, I guess we'll let you pick up where we left off. I know there are several people that want to speak today on certain rules. Um, I know uh, Kim Kiplin has asked to speak on some stuff. Uh, Steve Bresnan and possibly Steve Finolio uh, may want to speak on some stuff. So when we get to that, be sure that we uh, have time for that. But Melody, take it away. Okay. Well, we did. I'm so glad we were able to get the 
World's Review in before the COVID hit. Uh, we spent the whole day going through the rules one by one. Everybody had a, um, uh, I think Steve Manolio was there and Tim Kiplin was there. And uh, some of the main changes were they were going to allow temporaries on demand, which was uh, uh, would be a big asset to the charities, especially now, because we don't know what's going to happen day to day. We might not be open in two weeks. We don't know. So the only thing they need to do for that is to put that form back online to where you can apply for the temporaries on demand. We can get them, but we can't apply for it yet. But Tom said he would he would he would uh, handle that. He he was aware of it. Um, and like you said, Trace, I think Kim had uh, some comments. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if Steve does, but I'm sure he does. Uh, on some other rules with the um, about the worker about the workers, what we had to do to get them registered. And uh, Kim, would you like to speak or? Uh, I'm not sure how you want to handle this. I'm I'm happy to handle it any way that you would like for me to. I'm I'm happy to start commenting now or or wait until um, you're uh, through with your report. Well, I uh, it, it was a very long time ago when they sent out the uh, rules. I, I believe that Tom. I believe he tried to follow everything that we talked about. I do I do. Uh, one of the things that did change is we did not get a reduction in the uh, commercial SOAR renewal fee, and I can understand that because everybody right now is looking for money. So that was the only big get that I don't believe that we were able to obtain. Is that correct? Tyler, that's my understanding. Okay. Uh well, with with one small caveat is that uh, yesterday we received a comment relating to the electronic gift cards, and and due to that comment, we're going to have to postpone that rule and come back and and revisit it in the future. We just don't have enough time at this point to to adequately address it or consider it or discuss it or or really do anything by by next week. Um, so so that that rule is going to come out. Um, but we can we can certainly revisit it in the future. Okay. If, well, I, if I may, if I may, Melody, if um, I think I think there was a call last week uh, talking about some of the rules, and and there were some comments made about um, the the rules and stuff from last week. Um, I think in general the consensus was, and this is uh, what I'm reading on email and from word of mouth. I think in general everybody was supportive of of things except for uh, a couple of rules. I think 402702, 402700, and 402750. I think there was some some suggestions or comments from uh, the industry that that may that we're probably going to get into here in just a moment. But I think in general everybody kind of went along with the rule review. Yes, that's what I heard too. Tyler, what were the comments? Can you explain the problem with the gift cards or who made the comment or? Uh, sure. So we received a comment from the Kickapoo tribe of Texas that was concerned about the application of electronic gift cards, um, that it, it could possibly result in, uh, in, the, in the use of issuing credits on an electronic device similar to a slot machine. Um, and so they recommended that we omit that, that rule. And, and I think we internally discussed it and, and acknowledged the potential of the issues. It's not what we intended, obviously, but, um, but we're gonna need to take some time and involve industry and BAC and, and just have some internal discussions about how we're gonna go forward with it, if we're gonna go forward Tyler. with it. Tyler, if I may, uh, do the Kickapoos hold a bingo license in the state of Texas? No, the Kickapoos are a, are, are an, on an Indian reservation, and they hold a, a they're exempt federally, um, and so they operate. Bob, correct me if I'm wrong. It's, it's it's the highest class of gambling license. They're the only ones in Texas that they're allowed to have slot machines and table games and bingo 
um, they have a, a full unrestricted license for gambling. Okay. Um, so do they, do you know if they do any lottery, Texas lottery sales on their reservation? Uh, I do no, not. They don't. No, no, they don't. Okay. They're a long time right, frequent commenter on our rules. They, they track lottery and bingo rules and they're, they're very, very attentive. This is Bob Beard for the record. Uh, right. They're very atten attentive about anything that could be even remotely conceived as the tiniest yeah. crack in the door that would allow for anything that even vaguely resembles a slot machine. <laughs> Gotcha. Um, so my, I guess my, my next, my follow-up question to that, and this is the first I've heard of that, so I'm, I'm inquisitive, um, is the gift card uh, rule review, is that something that the industry in Texas has been um, pushing or is in favor of? Yes, that came, that came out of the a Bingo Advisory Committee meeting in March. Um, and I think it was raised very briefly in January, but in March, um, right? Oh, it's, I think one, uh, either Emil or Tommy brought it up, and then and then Will um, gave it quite a bit yeah. more support, and then so I think everyone was on board with it. Okay, just um, making sure that um, I was understanding that correctly. Mm. How long will it be before we look at that again? Well, I would think your next regularly scheduled BAC meeting, we can we can address it there, and then and then make a, a recommendation for the commission. It's the rule as proposed is is good for six months. It can be adopted up to six months, um, and so if it takes longer than that, we'll have to repropose it, which adds some time. Um, but I, you know, I I would think the we can we can look at it in the next next coming months, whenever the next BAC meeting is, get y'all's feedback. We need to discuss with uh, the Kickapoo folks, you know, what what they think about our possible revisions to the rule um, and then would have to present it to the commission. Well, let me just extend an invitation. Um, I'm, I'm sure that everybody would like to revisit this at the next BAC meeting um at this point um and please let us extend our invitation for them to be at the next bac meeting if they'd like to if it works out that way you know um anyone's welcome to visit the bac meetings and give their comments and and work through the bac this is tom my, my problem with that is they got slot machines and table games and bingo and they're worried about an electronic gift card yes okay so, hi this is ronica i have a question sure how does that um so the sweepstakes machines are getting really huge here in austin there's standalone game rooms that hold sweepstakes and those, they are put on a card as well. Who regulates that? Do we know? Uh, those are currently regulated by, by the local municipality. So whether a machine is a sweepstakes machine or a gambling machine is, is up to be determined by local law enforcement. And then if it is a, uh, an allowable sweepstakes machine, the city then regulates that. Okay, thank you. All right, Melody, back to you. You want to go back down the line again, or are you where are you at? Yeah, I, I, well, I'm a little stunned. When, when did the Kickapoo kick in? Uh, we when got it yesterday they, after their, their comment was made yesterday afternoon. That, that's convenient. Like a good lawyer, <laughs> they filed at the very last second. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, I, it, it's it is frustrating to have because the people that seem to be against this are anybody that we might compete with and, and bingo has no competition at all with the casinos. We're living proof of that in, in Dallas. But um, 
anyway, I find that a little frustrating. Because those were the – Kim and I were speaking yesterday. Those are the two, two main things that we really were able to push forward, temporaries on demand and electronic gift cards for the future. So, um, anyway, the, the rest of the rules, I, I, I don't think anybody had a big problem with anything else. Uh, well, I think were, Mel, Mel, if I may, I think I think um, I think Kim Kiplin wanted to speak on four hundred two seven hundred two, I believe. Yes, 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 yes. Those right. May I say something before we leave this issue? This is Kim Rogers. Sure. Um, Tyler or Tom, this, I guess this will be addressed more to you. If a Jane Susie would have made the same comment that the Kickapoo made yesterday before closing. Would it be slowing this down? Yes or no? Yeah, I think I think so because it's the fact that it came in at the last minute. It does present reasonable issues that we need to be concerned about, um, and and because it's at the last minute and because the commission meetings next week, we just we don't have enough time to to turn this thing around. So I think it's the prudent thing to do is to, to hold off for a little bit, no matter who okay. sent this in. Okay. That was my question because I, I don't see that they would hold more clout per se than a typical person. Very good. Thank you. Eh, I don't know about that. Okay. Well, yes. Let's let Kim speak on her, uh, the issues that she raised about uh, 407. Kim, you Thank want to you. go ahead? Thank you, Melody. This is Kim Kiplin for the record, and I'm, I really appreciate the opportunity to comment before the Bingo Advisory Committee on this issue, and I'm representing the Texas Department Veterans of Foreign Wars regarding this comment. And first of all, I want to say I, I, I think the, the process uh, since I want to go back to January has been very refreshing in terms of going through this rule review and having the meetings and, you know, the, the civil... Uh, conversations about it and the receptivity by the staff and Tom and Tyler I really want to tell you how much I appreciate that because a lot of the uh, in my view a lot of the suggestions that were made by the industry and the bingo advisory committee have been incorporated into these proposed amendments so thank you for that on behalf of the VFW thank you for that the and we do support the proposed amendments with the exception of the inclusion under uh, 402 702 as a disqualifying conviction, the wholesale lift of chapter 22 of the penal code assault of offenses. And this really is a very important issue to the VFW and it has to do with the veterans, uh, men and women who are returning, trying to find jobs. And I think we, we recognize the unemployment rate for veterans is pretty high. Um, and they may, they may be suffering from PTSD or some other some other uh, impairment um, and might just, you know, get into a bar fight or some kind of fight. We don't want them disqualified from being able to work in a VFW post. We think that that's a good community for that particular veteran to be in a, in a post and be working at uh, creating value for themselves, their family, their peers. So we're opposed to it for that main, that primary reason. Uh, and when we discussed this item, and I really appreciate Tom Hansen, you uh, uh, having the meeting with us on, I believe it was the uh, last week, last Tuesday. And the participants of that meeting were the, um, the Texas Lottery staff, and there was Tom Sturt, Steve Bresnan, Steve Finoli, and myself. I won't speak for the others, uh, and they can, they can chime in today in terms of their support on the VFW's position, but, but it's important to the industry in, in the sense that we don't necessarily want people disqualified for an assault offense. Um, and I thought Steve Bresen raised a really good point, and I, it probably should have occurred to me, but at the time it, it didn't. And that is that you look at the, the mission and the responsibility, the enabling statute, for the Bingo Enabling Act in terms of the commission's regulatory responsibilities. And it really is to regulate, to make sure that bingo is conducted fairly and that the net, net proceeds are distributed the way they should be. But, it, but it, I don't see how assault 
factors in on that. I can see theft for sure um, and other, uh, you know, forgery and things like that, but not assault. Um, and, I, and, and please understand, I'm not, I'm not saying one way or the other whether an employer would want to hire somebody who's got an assault offense, but I, I do agree with Mr. Bresnan. I don't think it's the agency's regulatory responsibility to do so. Um, an employer can get, conduct a background and make their own decision. I just don't want to see this become part of the regulation. The other uh, item that we discussed, and this is really kind of kind of the main reason I, I, I got so concerned, one, to the FW with the, the veterans, but the process right now is that if you fit, if you are on the on the registry or applying to be on the registry, and you, you in the, your criminal history background check pops up a disqualifying conviction, that immediately begins a a, a two pronged path. The commission is going to initiate, in my view, an enforcement proceeding, and you get an opportunity to provide mitigating factors. For example, veterans status, how long it's been, the age you were at the time of the, of the offense, but you're gonna go down one of two paths. They're either gonna take you to hearing and remove you or not put you on the registry, or you'll be, uh, you'll be required to enter into an agreed order that has uh, restrictions. And I, and I represented some time ago, a couple of brothers that got into a fight. I think they were, my client was 26, his older brother is 28. And, and, uh, and his older brother actually wrote a letter of reference, but it but required my client to be on an agreed order for three years. Three years could not be anything other than a bingo worker, could not advance. No matter if the employer wanted that person to advance, could not. Now, in the conversation that we had last week, uh, uh, and, and Tyler and Tom Hansen, I, I, I don't want to speak for you too much, but I think there was a general consensus on y'all's part that you would look at that differently in terms of the agreed order, you know, maybe uh, less of restrictions if it's a misdemeanor versus a felony. But the fact is, you're still going to be under an agreed order. And I just don't think it, in the large part that's fair. It may be, it, it really, to me, it comes down to that individual situation. I uh, really don't want uh, people with assault convictions, and that could be a deferred, by the way, but under this particular provision of the rule, deferreds are treated, can be treated as if they're convictions. And so for that reason, we are, we are opposed and we do not support including a wholesale in its entirety, chapter 22 penal code assault of offenses in the, in the disqualifying conviction rule 402-702. I'm happy to, to Answer any questions that anybody has. Appreciate you letting me put the comment on. Absolutely, Kim, no problem. Uh, does anybody else want to speak on this? Yes, uh, I do. Uh, <clears throat> this is Will Martin. Who's this? Will yeah. Martin. And I can, as a post commander for the American Legion, as a uh, member of the executive board for uh, disabled American veterans and uh, officer for the Vietnam veterans of America, I can tell you that we are definitely against this proposed amendment. There's a very high percentage of uh, veterans with PTSD that have an assault conviction. And if you look at that percentage, you'll find that the most of them go on to become productive citizens of our society. And a lot of them, including myself, are granted a license to carry a firearm in the state of Texas. And I can't see where the uh, Department of Public Safety would say you can carry a firearm, but the uh, Texas Lottery Commission says you can't work at bingo. That doesn't make any sense to me. I'm through. All right. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Will. Um, this this is Trace. Um, just to give a couple of comments on this, um, and I'm speaking personally on this. Um, I'm definitely uh, against the um, assault being a disqualifying uh, issue, whether it um, whether it's for a veteran or for a regular person off the street. Um, 
that really, to me, does not relate to the conduct of bingo. Um, you can have somebody that has, you know, like Kim said, been in a bar fight or just been in a fight defending someone. And if they don't have the proper, uh, they don't have enough um, financial means to defend themselves, they can take a plea deal uh, and get a uh, deferred or get uh, get a conviction, and then they're disqualified from from working. And they may be a great worker, they may be a not so great worker, but uh, I think it's hard enough as bingo employers and charities that are employing people to work. Uh, It's, it's hard enough uh, to be able to hire people that we think are good people. Um, So I'm definitely against this proposed rule as it stands with the uh, disqualifying convictions of assault. I'd like to make a comment. This is Tim Rogers. Grace, if you're finished. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I hear y'all talking, and I completely agree, Trace, Will, and Kim, with all three of you. I actually had this happen almost 20 years ago. One of the best employees that I've ever hired had a bar fight when he was 17. Long story short, lottery commission calls me. I have to let him go. Once it fell off his record, He came back to work for us in absolutely fabulous employee. Once again, never had a problem with him in a day, but because of a bar fight has nothing to do with bingo, nothing to do with handling cash, nothing to do with stealing anything of that nature. So I just wanted to let y'all know it actually does happen. This is is Melody. Can I make a comment too? Absolutely. Yeah. I agree with Kim, uh, not only about the assault charge being nothing to do with bingo, but also the fact that we as as uh, employers, we should be able to hire people we want to hire. I agree with you. We don't want to hire somebody that's been, you know, with thefts or, you know, other really violent felonies. But if somebody has an assault charge way back when, we should be able to, to decide if we want to hire them or not, not the lottery commission. And uh, we, have, we have a great commission we're working with right now, but you know, we've been through other ones that were very hard to deal with. So the, the fact that we, we have some control over who we hire, that would be a big asset to us. Because we, we know these people and they do not. So anyway, I agree with you. That's just my comment. Thank you, Melody. All right. Uh, comment, uh, in, okay, go ahead. I do also agree with y'all in regards to uh, the assault as well. So I don't think it should be a disqualifying factor. This is Jason Pohl, by the way. Thank you, Jason. Appreciate it. Glad you made it. Um, all right. Anybody else want to comment on 702? All right. Let's move on. Um, 402700, um, Steve Finolio, Steve Bresnan, do y'all want to comment on that? Are y'all on the call? I think there was some there's I think there were some things that were submitted to staff on four oh two seven hundred and four oh two four fifty. Um you, Trace, this is Tyler. I'll I'll chime in yeah. on uh summarize what, what Mr. Bresnan had said. Um so in in regard to seven hundred, seven hundred is covering the process for temporary suspensions, uh mm-hmm. which uh, you know, the BEA requires us to have a process and we've never had a process. And so we've never used it because we don't have a process. Well, now it's, it's going to provide for a temporary suspension in certain situations. And, you know, so for an organization that the sudden loss of nonprofit status or the failure to pay prize fees 
or the third category would be if if a relevant person gets a disqualifying conviction, which disqualifying convictions are only those for gambling or fraud. Um, those are the types of convictions the law requires us to, to deny or revoke a license for. And so Steve had asked for a little bit more explanation on, on how that's going to be applied. And in accordance with, with the BEA, um, and this will be covered in the preamble of the rule, the way that works is an organization may not have have any person uh, involved in bingo with one of those convictions uh, and a manufacturer or distributor and a lessor may not have any person required to be named on the license application with those convictions. And so and another thing that Steve asked for is that the agency reach out to those licensees first prior to suspending their license. Just give them a call and say, hey, this guy's got a gambling conviction. You need to remove him or we're going to suspend you. And so I've added that provision to the rule. And then I've explained that in the, pre in the preamble that in accordance with the act, um, these are the situations it's going to apply for. And again, so for, for a conductor, they can't have anybody at all, officers, directors, employees, whatever, that has one of those convictions. But for a manufacturer, a, license, a lessor, or a distributor, it's only somebody who's required to be disclosed on the application. So a, a board member or an officer is typically what it's going to be. So an employee, not necessarily a manufacturer, could have a low-level employee with a fraud conviction. And if that person is not required to be disclosed on their application, it will not result in a temporary suspension. Gotcha. Okay. Very good. Very good. And, and that was on. And then his, that correct. That was on 700 and on 450, 450 is the, the negative net proceeds waiver process. And the original proposed amendment was just a very, very small detail. And, and Steve recommended a, a more thorough reevaluation of the whole thing. And so he provided some language and, you know, I, I, I tweaked it a little bit here just to adjust formatting and whatnot, um, but it, generally it's going to provide a lot more specific information of what's required on a waiver, um, what's what constitutes a credible business plan. It's going to create a presumption that a business plan is credible if it contains the information that's listed and if the organization has not been granted a waiver in the previous three years, and then I went ahead and added after that, um, that's not including any waiver uh, granted on the grounds of force majeure. So for example, there's presumably going to be a lot of, of waivers granted in the next few months and, yes, and that will be due, due to COVID. And so those will not apply against your, your three year look back period. Um, whether we consider there's a presumption that your business plan is credible. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Yes. All right. Uh, does anybody else have any comments on any of that? All right, Melody. Um, is that uh, is that good for you on your report on the uh, rules? Yes, and I would like uh, all these uh, uh, the things that Tyler referred to and Bob. Are those going to come out again so we can look at that? Because what we have in our hands is, does not include any of these uh, revamping that they're talking about. Right? Sure. So the, the, uh, all this will be included in the, in the final adoption that's going to be proposed. Uh, we'll propose it at the, the commission next week. Uh, and Trace will be there. Uh, he can, you know, support it on your back. I would recommend that the committee supports the modifications that I've just talked about or, or doesn't. And then if you support them, Trace will present next week before I do. And he can say that BAC supports the, the proposed rules as amended uh, with the changes that, that we've just discussed. And then all of that will be published in the Texas register um, next week. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Trace. Yes, sir. For the record, Tom Hansen. Um, Tyler, you want to talk about um, our review of um, the assault section? 
Sure. So uh, we've, based on the comments we've received, we've just kind of preliminarily taken it out. Uh, well, of course, we were waiting to see what you guys said, and then you guys sounds like sounds like you unanimously support removing it. Um, so at this point, we're we're moving. Looks like we're we're just going to take it out, so it will not be in the rules. Uh, it still is in the guidelines, um, but that's something that that Tom can do at a later time can take it out. And of course, in the meantime, he doesn't have to enforce that. So we'll, we'll move, assuming this gets taken out, you know, the commissioners still have, have their say on it. Um, but assuming it gets taken out of, out of this rulemaking, then I think we'll move to take it out of the guidelines as well. And then should just stop looking at it altogether. That's great. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much. We do appreciate that. Mm -hmm. One other and I would item. like to uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, Tim Kiplin here and Tyler and Tom Hansen. Uh, for myself, I really appreciate your listening and making this change. And certainly on behalf of the Department of Texas VFW, we really appreciate your receptivity and your willingness to uh, interpret the comment, listen to the comment, and make the change. Thank you very much. Now, for the record, Tom Hansen, thank you for that. And Tyler, thank you for all your work on this and the comments from the industry. I, I will say that if our mandate included protection of the public, if that was stated in, in any type of writing about what we were supposed to do, we couldn't do this, but we do not have that mandate. Um, thank you. All right. Excellent. Well, um, I think at this point we probably need to make a motion that we would support um, the rules as recommended by the BAC. Um, uh, Trace, I'm, I'm sorry uh, to interrupt you, but uh, no, Steve Finolio has his, has his hand raised, and if Bill could, oh, he'd, okay. he'd like to speak on this. Absolutely. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks. I've been trying to comment and uh, for some reason could not. Uh, my my machine showed my voice was picking up, but y'all weren't hearing me. Uh, we support the comment on behalf of TCA. Uh, we support the comments that were made by Ms. Kiplin and by Mr. Breslin, and we also echo the comments of uh, for Tom and Tyler for being so open and uh, available for comments and I'll be happy to answer any questions or shut up. Thank you. All right. Um, anybody else need to, uh, anybody else have their hand raised? <laughs> All right. Um, so I, I think we need to, like Tyler said, I think we need to uh, make a motion and um, have a vote uh, on whether or not to support the uh, the rules as um, there. The, uh, Tyler, can can I get some help on this? How should how should I word sure. this? Sure, uh, I, I as would say amended or co correct. Yeah, I'd say to you know to, to move to support. Uh, the adoption of these rules with with the changes that have been described. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, can we uh, get a motion to? Um, this is Tommy. I'll make a motion to accept. Yeah. This is Jason. Hold a second. All righty. And uh, I guess we'll uh, we'll vote uh, all in favor. Aye. 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 All right. I think that's uh, a unanimous vote there. Excellent. And um, I would I would like to thank Tom and the staff and everyone for for being so um, receptive because uh, we've we've had years of of time periods where. Um, what we said didn't really count and it is really a breath of fresh air and it's it's nice to have uh, people that act professional and treat us as um, 
colleagues and regular people, and we appreciate that, and it is duly noted. I'll second that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Um, next item, um, discussion and possible actions on the recommendations for BAC nominations. Kim, you want to take this? Sure. Good morning, Kim Rogers. Um, we are, as written in the rules, the, the Bingo Enabling Act, to have nine members. We have eight. I know finding someone to fill the public was very difficult. Um, whether or not it was just getting someone to submit their nomination forms or be classified as a quote unquote public member. Veronica, I believe you're on as a lessor. You are the last one that we added on. Well, yes, I, I, um, okay. Kim, um, if everybody, I don't know if you guys remember, but we had spoke to Corey Harris and we had asked that he be um, put up for discussion. I don't know, that was kind of like, I think before the holidays. So I don't know what ever became of that. Was he supposed to show up at one of our meetings and did not? Uh, that yeah. We were supposed to um, invite him and that was passed on to somebody else. And so I don't know if that just fell through the cracks because we, you and I were, we weren't, we didn't need to contact him that somebody, and there's an email somewhere, I think that somebody was going to contact him. But I don't know. I can't remember who it was, but that was uh, if, if we can look at the notes, I'm sure somebody can figure out who was supposed to do that. So I don't know if he's still interested and I don't know how that process works. Was, was he a public member? Yes. Okay. And so what, so maybe it was the lottery or it was us that was supposed to contact him. It was not the, anybody from the BAC. I don't know. It, it was probably, from the lottery. And I'm gonna look for my notes real quick and see if I have anything. Okay, well, if he is a public member that you spoke with, I, I seem to recall he's a um, real estate agent. Yes. Has time, yes. okay, was very interested. Um, Tom, you and I kind of briefly spoke through an email just to see if you had any nomination forms. But is this something that we can, since we have already talked to him, we formed a, a not a, a work group, myself and Veronica, where we would call the individuals that submitted forms and speak to them. And, and I think that helps with talking to them. Um, what procedure would you like to go forward with if we want to talk about putting Corey Harris as the, or talk, interviewing him with the BAC? How would you want to handle that? So for the record, Tom Hansen, um, my suggestion would be that you go ahead and have that conversation. And if he decides that he wants to do this, we'll send him a form. Um, and of course, he will have to have a criminal background done. And then uh, it'll, it could be set up for uh, a vote um, once it's approved at the next BAC if that's acceptable to y'all. Excuse me, I we did that back in the winter. After I spoke to him, we had agreed that we were gonna, um, we had all voted on having him. So somebody was supposed to contact him from the Lottery Commission is what I'm reading. Because right. he was interested. If, if we drop the ball, we'll we'll reach out to him and make sure that everything is set up for that and see if he's still interested. Why don't we well, let me kind of let me kind of uh, put it lay out a form here. Why don't I contact him, see if he's still interested. I don't want to take up your time, Tom. And then if he is, then I will submit to you his telephone, his name and everything. You, I'm sure his um, nomination form is somewhere. And if you don't have it, okay, okay, then we can get that to you and then you can take it from there. That'd be fine. I just got a message from Angelica indicating that um, we did receive an application and we may have already conducted a background. I'll be able to let you know that within a couple hours. 
sounds wonderful. And you let me know that. And, and But I still need to call him because I'm sure, you know, it's been quite a while. And through this pandemic, he hasn't heard from us. So you bet if you can hold off until I get the results uh, of the application or the submission. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. I will do that. All right. Thank you. And so members, we will bring y'all, we'll send an email out to let you know if he's going to be in, uh, at our next meeting, we'll, for him to start or something of that nature. Any comments on this? Okay. And I think this takes care of item eight. All righty. Good deal. All right. Uh, I guess we'll move on to number nine or, or excuse me, any old business? Any public comment on old business? All righty. Any new business? Any public comment on new business? Anything anybody wants to bring up? I, I have something I'd like to bring up, actually. Um, I saw somebody put out an email regarding the Facebook um, games, Facebook Live regarding the gambling. Is there something we can do as a group or do we have to do it as individuals? Um, I get, I'm like everybody else, getting texts and emails with Facebook Lives and people opening pull tabs and that kind of thing. I mean, what what do we recommend? I mean, is there anything we, like I said, do we do it as a group? Do we do it as individuals? I know it's hurting um, my business. Yes, it definitely is. I think it's hurting all of our business. It is hurting um, our businesses. Tom, do you want to kind of maybe brief everybody on what the um, commission's doing on that or you want to Run without a minute or? The record, Tom Hansen. Um, yes. Okay. So there's three ways of taking care of this or at least dealing with it. Number one is if you go to that particular site, you have the ability to report that site for illegal activity. That'd be the first step for anybody who sees it. The second would be to get as much documentation as you can, good photographs, especially if it involves pull tabs, ways that we can identify that by its game name, by a serial number so that we can reach out to the manufacturers, and get them to stop uh, selling those. Um, the third method is to um, submit a complaint via um, our complaint form and give us as many specifics as you can to include names of folks or the site itself and we'll look at that. We have received several complaints. The enforcement division has conducted investigations, has sent certified letters when they could identify the individuals, have reached out to them by phone if they can have reached out to Facebook from a law enforcement perspective mm -hmm. and asked that those <clears throat> be terminated. Um, if and when the travel ban is lifted, the investigators have plans to reach out to those individuals face to face. Um, but that's where we stand right now. Any questions, any comments that you may have, reach out, let me know, and we'll do what we can. I, Tom, I have a question. This is Melody. You have been able to identify individuals themselves? Yes. In some cases, um, they are folks on the worker registry. And with those, yeah. they are receiving letters. That act in and of itself uh, may lead to them being disqualified as a bingo worker. Yes. Yeah. Well, you mentioned about so, the full tabs, and if you see a serial number... Because I've seen, I, I, like you said, I, I'm facing it very quickly. And then, you know, if I'm looking at it, they may not see it immediately. Yeah. But some of these full tabs they're running are full tabs that we run. You know, so you mentioned about having the designer full of full tabs. Uh, 
It just might be individuals, not not the whole pull tab itself. So these are tabs that we do run legitimately. Yes, but if they are sold on Facebook, it's outside of the license time or the location. Is that? I need you out of here. Both of you out. Oh yeah, no, they're doing it completely illegal. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's just very frustrating. It's not really the distributor's fault that the registered worker has ability to go in and, and steal the pull tabs. They, Agreed. They, uh, that's and that would and that would come out of the investigation. Um, I have a lot of faith in those enforcement folks, having been one of them for 15 years. I know that they're working hard at this. Um, and, and I know that with they're going to do due diligence and try to identify how they came into possession of the pull tabs, if in fact they were using them. I noticed that Emil has his hand raised and would like to make a comment. Yeah, yes, Tom, thank you. Uh, what I would ask you to do is when we trace those tickets back to a distributor, we can also is from, and we'd like for you to contact their regulators because they're violating their own state statutes by selling product outside of the license scheme in most of these cases. I don't disagree with that. And, and we also reach out to the manufacturer in, in order to identify where those uh, pull tabs came from and who they were distributed to. So unfortunately, they are available on the internet these days. Um, we've been able to actually shut down some of the sites, but not all of the sites. Tom, this is Trace. Um, so and maybe this is an odd question, but you mentioned earlier that some people had been taken off of the registry. Um, that's to somebody that's making five, six, seven hundred dollars a day. That's not a big issue. Is there criminal charges being filed as well by the lottery? I mean, is that a felony? Wouldn't that be? Okay, so we have two things going on. I'm sorry if I implied that there have actually been any acts that have been have led to someone removed from the worker registry. Uh, what I was saying is that particular act can create a situation in which they are removed. Yes, there are criminal charges. Um, and those are something I'll leave to the investigators to discuss with the prosecutors. But yes, um, it, it is a felony to conduct bingo without a license in this state. Pull tab is part of bingo. Therefore, it's a third degree felony. If in fact they are operating um, on, via Facebook and conducting bingo. Tyler, would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. All righty. Okay, anybody else want to comment on the Facebook or the pull tab uh, stuff? Hello, this is Ronica. Yes. Hello. Sure. Um, Ma'am. Who decides if they are removed from the registry and how do we go about doing that? So if in fact the organization, or excuse me, the investigation leads to the identification of a person who is on the worker registry, uh, the investigation uh, identifies them and provides that documentation to us, we have the ability to move forward with an administrative action. If that individual is prosecuted for that act, um, we, once we know that they have been convicted, um, then we have the ability to remove them based on the conviction. That help? It, it does. And so what kind of time frame would, I mean, just a guesstimate of once somebody is turned in and I mean, we know the name, the address, they're on the registry, you contact them and it is a felony because they're doing it for thousands and thousands of dollars and they're saying it's for charitable and it's not. So what, like once that is done, how, what do you think the time frame would be to where charges will be filed and prosecuted? 
it's hard to say that at this point. Um, I know that in personal contact with the uh, prosecutor in Dallas, I was told that it was anywhere from nine months to a year before they were going to look at nonviolent criminal acts for the grand jury. Not sure how it is in other parts of the state, but I know COVID is creating a situation in which it's hard to have a grand jury uh, together um, in a small environment looking at these cases. Um, it, it used to be anywhere from six months to a year before we got a prosecution um, completed. Um, I can't say it's going to be that. It could be longer. Um, it really depends on the location. So um, I guess my quest another question would be, is Facebook closing those sites down? So I've been under the impression that there have been a few that have been shut down based on the submission from the investigators. There is a law enforcement path to Facebook and there is also a personal path to Facebook to report criminal acts. Um, it is my understanding in some circumstances that the site has been shut down and then opened back up under another name and promoted to individuals that were on the original list. So we're not getting them all down, but we are hitting them as we can. It's uh, kind of like whack-a-mole at this particular point in time, but we are trying. Okay, thank you. So Tom, let me let me ask a, a, a question. I, I know that by the rules and by the the, the law, that what they're doing is illegal. Would it give the investigators and the Lottery Commission staff more teeth if maybe we wrote a rule that says, I know it would be redundant, uh, but uh, we have a lot of redundancy in our rules and our laws, uh, but saying that Facebook gambling, Facebook pull tabs, all that, and list those items, you know, are a third degree felony if you're caught doing it would that give the investigators and maybe the prosecutors some teeth i think one of the issues with the eight liners back in the days and playing whack-a-mole uh was that the prosecutors didn't feel like they had enough teeth to to go after certain places would that benefit the agency and the industry as well to actually have a rule stating that all that's illegal So I'm going to ask Tyler to weigh in on this. Sure. Uh, so I, I think this is pretty clearly different than the A-liners. The, the problem with the A-liners is that there's <laughs> people can have a reasonable disagreement as to whether or not it's actually gambling. And, and so from the prosecutorial standpoint, first of all, they have to prove that it's gambling. And that's, that's difficult with the A-liners. Whereas with this, this is clearly bingo. And then the issue is, do you have a license or not? And if you don't have a license, then it's a felony. So uh, this is, from from my viewpoint, is a pretty easy case to prosecute. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's a high priority or or that you know they necessarily will. But I don't think that we really need a rule. I mean, the, the, a prosecutor doesn't care about our rules. They only care about what the state law says. And the state law says that this is this is clearly a felony. So it's just up to up to the DAs and the local city councils whether or not they want to go after it. So does that include the virtual horse races that they're doing online? Yes. Uh, yeah, I would assume that. I mean, that would be for the racing commission, but presumably the racing commission act says the same thing that as ours. That if you do, if you're doing a horse race without a license, it's a felony. I'm sorry. That's not so. A horse race is a is um, a type. Oh, of bingo. a type of bingo. Yeah, any any type of bingo, whether it be pull tab or or any lotteria or any anything defined as bingo in the Bingo Enabling Act requires a license. And if you don't have a license, then it's it's felony gambling. Okay. And Trace, just so you know, you said five to seven hundred a day. Some of these folks are knocking down three to seven thousand a day. Exactly. On these horse races. There's some that are up to ten thousand dollars 
and that game sold out in 15 minutes. And they probably made five grand on that. Exactly. That was exactly what it was. Well, sounds like we're in the wrong business, guys. Exactly. <laughs> the record, Tom Hansen, I didn't hear that. <laughs> well, we well, need like knock knock rooms. It's very difficult for any investigator to get into these rooms because if they don't know you, they don't let you in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, guys, this is Tyler Vance. Um, you know, we've talked about kind of how the commission has somewhat limited jurisdiction and then, you know, whether a, a DA wants to take this, you know, I would encourage you to reach out to your, your congressman and, and uh, you know, the session's coming up and, and this is only going to become more and more of a problem in the future. Um, and so I would encourage you to reach out to your legislators and, and try to seek a, a solution through them, maybe stronger penalties or, you know, something to incentivize prosecutors to go after this. I agree. Excellent. All right. Any other comments on uh, the Facebook gambling? All right. Okay. Let's, uh, let's uh, try to set a date for the next meeting. Uh, the next uh, commission meeting is next Thursday, October the 1st. Um, do we want to set one for November? November? And maybe before the holidays get started? Well, we want to set it in time to be able to bring the uh, electronic gift card back up. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, what, uh, have you got a suggestion, Tommy, on the, or? When, when's the next commissioner's meeting after October 1st? We don't have it scheduled, but we're aiming for December. December's usually when we have our, our last one of the year. Well, November would be, would be good then, Trace. That'll give uh, Tyler and them plenty of time if they need to prepare anything before the meeting. Well, okay. just to be clear, there's a practice under the governor's office that any rule proposal that we're going to be making, I'm sorry, this is Bob Beard for the record. Uh, we have to submit that to them a month in advance of the meeting. The current December meeting is set for December 3rd. Okay. Um, if we're wanting to do that, then we would have to do it on Monday, November the 2nd. Is that correct, Bob? Uh, well, sometime that week. I mean, we would have to get a memo. We would have to have our, I mean, we would have to have our documents ready by the first week of November. So if whatever y'all want to do in advance of that would have to happen before the first week of November. What about the third week of October? I am going to the third week of October. I am going to be out of the country. To, wait, are you talking about the 19th through the 23rd? Yes. Well, we could do it somewhere either the 13th or 27th so they could have enough time to do what they need to do. I'm available both. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to. I'm going to ask Steve Finolio what, what Steve Finolio, what, what are your thoughts on this, on time frames? Do you think we would have time to maybe collaborate and look at this and get this in on in time? I'm just, I'm curious. I'm raising my hand. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes, with much echo. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what's going on. Steve, are you on headphones or anything? Or Grace, Kim Kiplin also has her hand raised. Okay. Kim, you want to go ahead while Steve fixes his technical issue? Sure, Kim Kiplin here for the record. It, I guess I was confused 
when we talked in earlier about the comments re uh, you all received by the Kickapoo tribe and that you're going to pull down the electronic gift card, are you formally ending that rulemaking or are you just not going forward at the October meeting to present it for adoption? Because if you're not, if you're just not going to present it, then it's still a live rulemaking as long as we're obviously within the, the six month period of time. And then I guess I want to be clear, it, does that mean if it's a current rulemaking, but there will be amendments to it in response to comment? Do you have to submit that to the governor's office for review 30 days prior to a meeting? Uh, Bob, I'm going to defer to you on this one. I, I'm, Kim is correct. It, it will still be a live rule. I'm not sure about the governor's office. Yeah. Well, the current plan is to bring the package for adoption at October 1st without this, without this one proposal in it. But does that mean that it's still live and you, you no. left it? To, okay, no, so you, it means you have to start a new with, rulemaking. Okay, so you're formally withdrawing it. Thank you for the clarification. I mean, that's the wow, current you're plan. You're formally There's withdrawing that over one comment last night. Yes, sir. It needs to be worked out. It requires some time, and I don't think we have enough time before we, we ha have the commission meeting to be sure that we can do all that then run everything by all of you guys. So okay. I have my hand raised or my hand. So whatever they, you, so Bob, redoing this, then Kickapoo once again is gonna to have to agree with it? I don't get to decide these things. Uh, oh, but, I didn't get the question. But let me I'm tell not you, asking you. But I believe it. what we would like to do is we would like to come up, we would like to make sure everyone's on board and not receive a second comment from the Kickapoos that say hell no to this proposal. So that is what, that's just the world that we live in and the forces, the people who keep a watch on what we do. If, if you want to go through this process and not get into a fight, yeah, that's what we're going to have to do is, is try to find language that accommodates everyone's interests. Which I, I hope we can do. We've always, we've, we've been able to do that on different occasions in the past, but you know, it's going to require some engagement. And they did, they commented within the time period. So it's not like this is a late comment or anything. It's just, you know, most state agencies don't just propose rules at one meeting and bring them back to the next meeting for adoption. We're kind of unique and accommodating to do that here. But, you know, we, the rulemaking, as Kim alluded to, could take up to six months to do. But you know, we try to bring them around. We try to turn them around as quick as we can. But uh, if we're going to do that, then that kind of, if, if there's a hiccup on something, then it's going to take us more time. So if, if I understand this correctly, you're, you're pulling that from the rulemaking process. So in order to revisit that, we have to start from scratch. Is that correct? S starting from scratch just means to present a new rulemaking proposal at a, at a second commission meeting. It doesn't undo all the work you've done already. It just means- Right, but, I'm, but I mean, we have out. to restart the process. We have right. to and I mean, the other alternative is okay. to just not bring the rules up for adoption at the October commission meeting. Well, this is Fenolio. Uh, I think we should get the rules that we can agree on adopted. And I say we, we we've all agreed. Uh, and uh, it may be that uh, this one rule uh, we can work with the kickaboos on, or if we can't, uh, we at least aren't blindsided at the last moment by a comment that they made. So I, I think uh, Bob- Have we afforded a copy of that comment? We'll get one, yes. Uh, but I think what Bob has laid out, and I guess Tom is, is the most appropriate thing to do right now, given, you know, this isn't their fault. This is something Kickapoo, just a drive-by filing. Uh, they know some of us uh, in here, and they could have reached out to us, but they chose not to for whatever reason. So let's get the rule. There are some rules that are very important 
that need to be adopted in my view. And so let's get those adopted and we'll come back on this one rule. That's my view. This, this, I'll, I'll Kip, agree with that. Agree. This is Kim Kiplin here, and, and uh, I support Steve Finolio's view on that. We don't want to lose, you know, all the rulemaking. The the staff has decided that they're going to just pull this down. Um, I think it will probably require some meetings, several communications with the commenter, and everybody to get comfortable with that or know where they stand and move forward any way if possible. So. Um, I support your comments, your insight, and also on the staff's part. I think uh, it's probably the prudent thing to do, uh, given the, the the commenter. And then let's move forward with what we can. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. I appreciate it. All right. So um, back to the next um, the next date, um, Tommy. I'm I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I know you wanted to get this done, but it doesn't look like it's going to happen by the end of this year. Oh, no, I don't, um, I don't have a problem with that. I'm, I'm in agreement with Steve, too. We need to get the ones passed we can. Good deal. Um, so do y'all want to look at doing like a mid-November meeting to kind of get things wrapped up before the holidays kick in? Um, or do y'all want to postpone it to, I think we've met our requirements um, for the meetings, the amount of meetings that we have this year. Um, I think this will be, I think we're required to meet once a quarter, I believe. And I think we've, I think we've met that. Um, so do y'all want to do a mid November meeting, say maybe something the ninth through the 13th before holidays come in? That'll work. Uh, this is Will Martin. Uh, yep. just, just remember, November the 11th is Veterans Day. Uh, so around that uh, sacred holiday, we uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. Okay. What about the 12th? Uh, well, well, let me ask you, uh, what, what about that following week, the 17th through the 20th? Um, anybody got an issue with that one? That would be great. I'm available, let's, Jim Rogers. That'll work. Okay, let's. Okay, let's say uh, November seventeenth, maybe. Ten a.m. Works for me. Mm -hmm. right. Sounds good. And we're leaving the option open that we can maybe be able to have it in Austin at a face to face, or are we? I don't think we're going to see major changes between now and the middle of November. So I would recommend that you all look at another Zoom meeting at least uh, until January. Okay. And we'll get better at this too. <laughs> at our Trace, at our next meeting, can one of you say the Pledge of Allegiance and then we'll follow with the Texas? Well, that's what I was going to, I was going to comment on that. I know we didn't have that today. And um, one of the reasons was because of all the open mics. Um, however, um, I would like to suggest that the next meeting, uh, what Kim is suggesting is that one person, uh, actually say the Pledge of Allegiance and another person actually say the, 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 the Texas, uh, flag pledge as well. Um, and that sounds like a wonderful idea, Kim. Um, I would be glad to do that. We'll, we can swap off. I think that's an integral part of our meetings, and I, I get why it was not done this time. I think it would, I think it would um, be sad if we didn't at least have someone read it uh, with a mute on or something like that. That way, we can at least uh, accomplish that. Thank you. Thank you.
All right. So uh, we've got the next date set. The only thing left to do is adjourn. Thank you, everyone. And uh, remember, be safe. And if you uh, need to email or call, I'm always available. But I respond better to calls. <laughs> I thought you respond better to text messages. Well, I do respond better to text. That's that's why on my answering service it says, please text me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I will just extend my thanks to the group for your participation in the process and uh, thank you for all the nice comments and Tyler and Bob, I, I hope you hear these folks are happy um, and we're doing the best that we can for them. Thank you. Thank you.